Good evening and good afternoon, everyone, and a very well, warm welcome from Jerusalem. My name is Karen Sethill. I'm Program Manager for Europe at the National Library of Israel, and it is a great pleasure to open this first event in our series in Her Majesty's Kingdom, celebrating the rich history of Anglo Jewry. I'm delighted that Professor Todd Endelman has agreed to be the first speaker in this series because, in fact, he was the inspiration behind it. The National Library of Israel has been working working together with the British Board of Deputies Hidden Treasure Network of Jewish Archives in Britain, for whom we're delivering a training course on Jewish archiving. Todd gave the opening lecture in that course, which was such an excellent overview of Anglo-Jewish history that we wanted to give you, our online audiences, the opportunity to hear it too. From this, we developed the idea in the special Platinum Jubilee year for Her Majesty to create a series to feature other expert speakers, including some from the Hidden Treasures Network, and to present some of the rich and diverse archives and collections that tell the centuries-long story of the Jewish community in the United Kingdom. We'll be holding these events over the next few months, and you can sign up for updates on these through our newsletter, and I'm sure today we'll put the, we'll put the link um, during the course of this evening's event. Todd M. Endelman is Professor Emeritus of History and Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. Educated at the University of California, Berkeley, and Harvard University, he taught at Yeshiva University and Indiana University before coming to Michigan in 1985. He is a specialist in the history of the Jews of Britain and the social history of Western European Jewry in the modern period. His books include The Jews of Britain, 1656 to 2000, Leaving the Jewish Fold, Conversion and Radical Assimilation in Modern Jewish History, and most recently, The Last Anglo-Jewish Gentleman, The Life and Times of Redcliffe Nathan Salomon. But before I hand over to Todd, I would like to introduce my colleague, Daniel Lipson, reference librarian, who will open this evening with some prayers for Her Majesty the Queen from the National Library of Israel. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Karen. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so rather than reciting or even trying perhaps to sing a prayer to the Queen, I'd like to show you prayers written for the kings and queens of England over the last 150 years or so. So in honor of this year's uh, 70th Coronation Jubilee for Her Majesty, uh, Majesty's Coronation, uh, let's quickly see how royal coronations were celebrated by the Jewish communities in the United Kingdom, in the Commonwealth countries and other places around the world. And we'll do this uh, by using items from the National Library of Israel's collections. So I assume some of you are familiar with, uh, with Chief Rabbi Nevis' uh, um, Queen's Platinum Jubilee Prayer, which is, an updated, which is updated and republished. But many other similar prayers were printed uh, over the years for, uh, and then di distributed around the communities uh, for different coronations of the different kings and queens. Most of them are very similar, and they include Obviously, Vanoten Shualim Malachim prayer, a few chapters from Tehillim, a prayer for that king or that queen, and they all end with Aleinu uh, Mishabach and Adon Alam. Uh, quite often, there'll be a sermon given by a rabbi, there'll be a choir singing, and uh, if it takes place, if the ceremony takes place during the weekday, uh, weekdays in the afternoon, the Mincha prayers are also added. These are all printed in small, um, normally paperback prayer books. Many of, uh, many of them are in uh, the National Library's collections. So let's go back to Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, 1887. Here we see Jubilee service for the protection afforded to our most gracious sovereign Queen Victoria during a long and prosperous um, uh, reign, 50, 50 years. This was printed by the Spanish and Portuguese synagogues, the Sephardic commun uh, communities. Here we see the prayer written for Queen Victoria published inside this uh, booklet. 10 years later, 60th anniversary of the coronation, uh, again, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogues republished their book, update, the, update them, of course. And on the right hand side, we see a uh, service of the prayer and thanksgiving. This one was used in the synagogues of the British Empire 
for the celebration of the 60th anniversary. But the sun never sets in the British Empire and other prayers were written and printed in other countries across the world. On the right hand side, we see a prayer printed in Bombay, India, in the, in the center, prayer and thanksgiving used in a great synagogue in Sydney, in Australia. And on the left hand side, we see a, a song, Hegut Lev, printed here in Israel, and this is during uh, the Ottoman period. Uh, when, when the Queen when Queen Victoria uh, dies, her son, King Edward VII, ascends to the throne, him and Queen Alexandra. Tefillah, the Kol Zimra, order of service used in the London synagogues for their coronation. This is in 1902. But in this uh, short prayer book, right at the end, an additional paragraph has been added. And you can see, you can even see the lines around it. This was stuck in at last on in the last moment, it was stuck into the coronation prayer book. And to Theo God, do we give thanks for the sword has been put into the scabbard and that covenant of peace and brotherhood has been established. And this is referring to the second war, war, war that had just ended uh, a month uh, beforehand, before the coronation, which was a very important event, so important that the editors of this prayer book decided to actually put in an extra paragraph at the end of the prayers of the coronation, of the coronation of King Edward VII. A poem, poem was written in his honor by Joseph Mesel, who was um, a Jewish immigrant from Russia who settled in Manchester. He was a printer and a writer, a poet, and he wrote uh, for this occasion, for the occasion of the coronation of King Edward, um, a song in Hebrew, and it was translated into Yiddish and in English. All three languages appear in the same uh, booklet. Next, we have uh, the coronation of King George V and his wife, Queen Mary, uh, in, 1900, in 1911. So, uh, on the second, on the left hand side, we again we see the prayers printed by the synagogues of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogues, again updated. And on the right, on the right hand side, order for service for the synagogues of United Hebrew Congregations in His, Maj in His Majesty's Empire. This is in 1911, and another prayer in 1911 for the coronation printed in Bombay, three languages, Hebrew, English, and Marathi. This was in uh, Bombay, India. On the right hand side, another prayer for the coronation of, uh, of King George, uh, this time in Calcutta. On the, on the left hand side, a similar one from the great synagogue in Sydney, uh, prayers began at 11 o'clock a.m. on that Thursday. Next, George VI and Queen, uh, and Queen Elizabeth, later known as Queen Mother, um, uh, their coronation is in 1937. This time, a Spanish and Portuguese synagogue print uh, a, a hardback, nicer looking book with gold letters, again, in both in English and in Hebrew. All of these prayers always are both in, in two languages, at least. In Tianjin, in northern, uh, in northern China, where there was a Jewish con congregation of uh, a community of about 2,000 to 2,500 uh, people, they printed their own uh, small prayer book for Coronation Day in 1937. This is what it looks like. It's very short. It's just a couple of pages in English and in Hebrew. 1937, as the coronation celebrations were going on in London, here in Israel, there was a coronation ball this time. Now we're talking about the British mandate period here. Uh, the, in preparation for this uh, ball, the small um, booklet was printed and you can see pictures of the hall where the celebrations took place and the full program. There were a number of bands playing and the ceremony and the celebrations ended at, uh, in, in, uh, at 9 o'clock p.m. with dancing, fireworks, and refreshments in Tel Aviv. Uh, this coronation, King George VI coronation, is the first time we see Princess Elizabeth in the prayer books, in Hanoten Shua prayer. So Princess Elizabeth together with, uh, at the time of Princess still, she was 11 years old, together with the rest of the royal family. And Princess Elizabeth became Queen Elizabeth II in 1953, the year after her father 
passed away. תודה וכל זימה, להכתרת גבירתנו וקווין, המלכה אליזבטה, ירום הודה. This was um, uh, printed for, uh, for Queen Elizabeth's coronation by the office of the chief rabbi. But there was a small mistake. If you, you, can, you can see on the left-hand side of the page in the Hanoten Shua uh, prayer, we see a sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth the queen, her mother, and Queen Mary. And queen Mary was the queen mother, or rather the queen grandmother, but she'd already passed away um, uh, at the time of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. In this book, uh, and on the prayer for Queen Elizabeth, it, we see in the middle, it says, the day is coming, the day will be soon. And there's an asterisk pointing to the bottom where it says, on the coronation day, say, today is the day of the coronation. This means that this book was printed probably quite some time before the coronation, and Mary, queen, queen mother, or grandmother, or whatever, was probably still alive, and they just didn't have enough time to reprint the book. Um, but this mistake was corrected in another uh, prayer book for the coronation, this time printed by the office of Vada Rabbanim. You can see on the left-hand side that uh, Queen Mary no longer appears there. She'd uh, already passed away a couple of months beforehand. As this was going on, in Israel, uh, in honor of Queen Elizabeth's coronation, a, a forest was planted, uh, the Queen Elizabeth coronation forest. In the picture on the, side, on the left hand side, you can see Vera Weizmann, the wife of President Weizmann, President of Israel, and the wife of uh, British uh, ambassador, uh, John Nichols, uh, at the celebration. The, a book was printed uh, especially for this occasion, which includes uh, a poem written in honor of Queen Elizabeth, uh, a few other uh, articles, and lists of uh, the people or the communities who donated money uh, to this forest, um, uh, which was planted in Israel, not, uh, not far from the towns of Natsrat and Midal Emek in the southern Galilee. And finally, 25 years later, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II celebrates her Silver Jubilee in 1977. And these are additional prayers which were printed for this occasion. So all that's left is to wish Her Majesty the Queen good health, long years, and uh, God save the Queen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel, for setting the scene so wonderfully with our collections. And it just, I'm just left now to hand over the microphone to Todd. Please start your lecture for us. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh, the history of um, uh, Great Britain is rarely written by his English historians as a history of immigration. Uh, the British have been very slow to come to realize that indeed immigration has played a great role in the history of the country. But ten, traditionally, it's not viewed as a country of immigrants, it's a nation of immigrants. This has been changing over the past few decades, and there's a new recognition, lar largely sparked by the large immigration, first from the former colonies, and then from later uh, from other places around the world. And I think the history of the Jews in Britain is best seen in this context as a history of successive waves of immigrants from different parts of the Jewish world to Britain with each wave having its own distinctive characteristics. And the first settlement of Jews in Britain really begins very early in the history of uh, Britain and that is with the Norman invasion. In 1066, when William the Conqueror defeated uh, King Harold II at the Battle of Hastings, he inaugurated really the beginnings of Jewish history in England. Jews had lived for centuries uh, in um, Normandy, in the realms of William the Conqueror, particularly in the city of Rouen. And when William the Conqueror passed over the channel and came uh, to London, uh, Jews accompanied or followed in his footsteps. Uh, and they settled in London, but also in other important trading cities within Britain. 
The Jews who came were largely engaged in money lending, pawn broking, and to a lesser extent in the trade in grain. These were Jew which were occupations that they had followed uh, in Normandy. These Jews uh, were native French speakers, uh, but they knew, at least the men knew, both how to uh, uh, use Latin and Hebrew. In England, uh, as indeed anywhere else in the world at the time, uh, in the medieval period, uh, Jews were seen as a distinct group. That is to say, a collective group, a, a nas separate national group, uh, they were treated like a corporate group because, in fact, most medieval societies were based upon corporate orders. Um, and they had their own laws, which applied specifically to them. Uh, there was no notion of individualism or individual laws in medieval societies. Um, they were subject to and really at the mercy of uh, the monarch himself. Now, the reason that uh, William uh, supported uh, Jewish settlement was that the Jews who came uh, were a valuable resource to the monarchy. Um, and in a sense, they helped him with his fiscal needs. Um, it was very different, difficult for medieval monarchs to tax the wealthy, uh, large landowners in the state um, because of the nobility who held great political power. However, it was quite easy to tax or to uh, impose special financial levies on the Jewish population. So what happened was the monarchies tended to use the Jews, and this was certainly true in England, as what we call a financial sponge. Uh, the Jews would absorb the money, profits from money lending, and then they would fall uh, prey to the monarch who imposed special taxes and levies on them. Therefore, siphoning off indirectly money from the nobility. Um, we know a great deal uh, about uh, medieval English Jewry, largely because they were involved in many money lending. Uh, money lending was tightly regulated uh, by the monarchy and all loans that Jews issued were recorded and then the papers deposited in chests that were under royal authority in, uh, in London. Uh, so from this, we learned all kinds of things about the Jews there, about where they settled, etc. Uh, the number of Jews in Britain uh, during the medieval period was not large, at the most 5,000. And when they were finally expelled in 1290, uh, maybe they were uh, 2,000. Uh, the history of Jews in medieval England is punctuated uh, by persecutions, uh, by confiscations, uh, by violence, uh, by blood libels, etc. And it was not too different in this sense from the rest of Europe. And it's really not necessary to rehearse the history of the Christian demonization of Jews and their negative evaluation of Judaism, uh, because this is a story that's fairly well known. As a rule, uh, and of course there are exceptions, the king uh, in England, as indeed elsewhere in medieval Europe, acted as a protector of the Jews uh, because they were a valuable resource. Um, uh, sometimes powerful nobles played this role, but most likely was if there were threats to Jews, particularly violence, it came from below, either from the church uh, and zealous uh, priests, uh, or from mob violence. There's really only one episode in particular that stands out as distinct uh, in the history of medieval Jewry in, in the terms of persecution, and that is the first blood libel in Europe, the accusation that Jews used the bloods of Christians for some kind of ritual purpose. The very first one occurred in Norwich in, 1040, in 1144, 1144. Now, on 1290, all the Jews living in uh, England were expelled. Um, and this was a result both of mounting religious hostility and declining usefulness. That is to say, the more the, the, the uh, monarchy taxed the Jews, 
the more difficult it made uh, money lending for them, uh, the less valuable they were as a resource. Uh, so in this sense, the monarchy killed the goose to lay the golden egg. Um, 1290 is important though, not just in Anglo-Jewish history, but in the history of European Jewry as a whole, because it's the first time that the Jewish community, the complete Jewish community of an entire country was expelled. The most important expulsion of the medieval period being of course, the expulsion from Spain in 1492. Now from 1290 until the middle of the 17th century, there was no Jewish community in Britain. Jews were expelled. The Jews who had been in Britain moved across the channel back to Normandy and other places in Northern France. Um, and Jews were not permitted to settle in Britain. We know of individual Jews, not communities, but of individuals who from time to time made their way to England on a temporary basis, but there was no settled Jewish community. The second wave of migration of Jews to Britain, which does uh, sink deeper roots, begins in the early 17th century. And this is a migration of conversos, Jews of Spanish and Portuguese origin, whose ancestors had been forcibly converted to Christianity and their children were still known as conversos, had many cases some awareness of their Jewish origins, had some sense of Jewish consciousness. They begin arriving in, in uh, London uh, in the early 17th century. They come to England, not because there's, a, there, in a sense, there's any kind of legal recall, but they arrive as Spanish and Portuguese merchants. Now, many people know that in fact, of their Jewish origins. They're not practicing Jews at the moment, at least when they arrive, uh, but they're tolerated as Spanish and Portuguese merchants. Um, and the leading figures in this community, uh, in these, this uh, converso migration to Britain, are really part of a larger dis uh, dispersion of the Sephardim throughout uh, the Atlantic world. It's, it includes Amsterdam, Hamburg, Bordeaux, and then uh, colonies in the Caribbean and eventually colonies in North America. And they were all part of this larger Atlantic uh, community of trading networks. Now in the early part of the, uh, well, really the, 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 of the Commonwealth, uh, they begin under Oliver Cromwell, they begin to emerge as a, as a community. That is, in the 17, excuse me, in the 1650s, they begin to, so to speak, throw off their Christian cloaks and they establish a community. They purchase a cemetery and eventually they build a synagogue. Now they're able to do so, <clears throat> and specifically uh, beginning in 1656, because they received some kind of guarantee, we have no written evidence of it, but some kind of guarantee from Cromwell that they would be tolerated. This new toleration, again, it has to be, you have to put quotes around the word toleration. Uh, it's a kind of guarded toleration. But there was great interest in Jews in the mid-century, it's mid-17th century. It was a part of what I would call rampant philo-Semitism, but again, philo-Semitism has to have quotation marks around it because these people were uh, the, the kind of a Puritan and other um, uh, religious millennialists uh, thought Jews would play an important role in ushering in um, the, the reappearance of Jesus and eventually the end of the world and you know the, the future and everything. Now, this philo-Semitism was based upon a Protestant understanding that Catholicism had failed to convert the Jews over the centuries, but that a new, improved, reformed, rehabilitated Protestant Catholic Christianity, that is Protestantism in England, would be able to do so. And there was a belief that Jews had to be admitted to the four corners of the world 
And what better place, some English millennialists thought, uh, than England to make Christianity acceptable to Judaism. So they were eager to admit Jews, but mainly because they saw them as potential Christians. Um, there was also on the part of the government some recognition of the importance of Jews as a trading community <clears throat> and in terms of Cromwell as suppliers of <clears throat> intelligence information uh, from the continent. The greatest monument of this Spanish and Portuguese community that's established in the 1650s is the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in Bevis Marx, uh, which was erected in 1701. For the converso migration, for the second wave, their settlement and integration into English life was relatively, I stress the word relatively easy, in the sense that their social amalgamation did not uh, meet with great opposition. Part of this is due to the fact that they had uh, lived as Christians before com coming to Britain, and so they were familiar with Western European culture. Some of them had even attended university, either in Amsterdam or in Spain or in Portugal. Uh, perhaps the most prominent example of this uh, uh, degree of acceptance was Benjamin Disraeli, whose family actually was only half Sephardic, the other half were Italian. Disraeli never made any great deal about his uh, Italian roots, but he did about his Spanish uh, Sephardic roots. Um, and anyways, Disraeli's, uh, no, Disraeli's grandfather was a broker. Um, Disraeli's father was a minor man of literature. And Benjamin Disraeli, of course, was a great conservative politician. Now, <clears throat> one thing that these Jews benefited from, and indeed all Jews who migrated to England benefited from, is that they landed in a country in which there were no anti-Jewish laws on the books. Most Jews lived in states with their specific charters or regulations about what occupations they could pursue, what cities they could live in, what kind of discriminatory taxes they had to pay, etc. There were no laws on the English books of this kind. And so this was a great benefit that none of these restrictions existed at the time. Jews who were born in England from the time they arrived there, uh, from 1656 on, were considered English citizens. To be sure, they were second class citizens, but in that sense, they were no dis different than people who dissented uh, from, the, or that is, the nonconformists from the Church of England, or from no different than Roman Catholics. And those who were born abroad were not considered as Jews legally, but simply as other aliens were. And they paid the same kind of tax rates, for example, and had the same kind of access to legal equality that other aliens did. And it varied from case to case. Uh, and also important is the fact that they were not treated as a collective group. Um, they were individuals. And when they came to law, they were not jury laws that applied to them but they, the law as it was generally understood applied to them. The third wave is from the continent, mainly from the German states. And it, it's better described not so much as a wave, as a trickle, but a long-term trickle. A trickle that begins really in the late 17th century and continues all the way until the early 19th century till the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. This is a migration of Yiddish speaking Ashkenazim. Most of them, unlike many of the Sephardim, are poor. Uh, they lack skills uh, in art, of an artisanal can, kind, and they tend to be petty traders, um, dealers in secondhand goods, uh, this, things of this kind. They come to Britain uh, for two reasons, both a push and a pull. The push is that in the German states, and there is no unified German state at this time, but in the individual German states, uh, they are hedged in by a whole host of restrictions, uh, restricting the numbers of them that can marry at any time, 
uh, and they suffer from a discriminatory taxation, uh, and they are arbitrarily blocked from entering all kinds of occupations. So in part, there's the, that's the push. The pull is that there are no residential restrictions in Britain, and there are no anti-Jewish occupational laws in Britain. So they can do business more or less as they did before. They are also different from the Spanish and Portuguese Jews who uh, came in the second wave in that they are uh, highly visible. That is, uh, they don't speak a European language, they speak Yiddish, uh, their dress is different, and their occupational role stands out. They stand out particularly as um, dealers in secondhand goods, old clothesmen, peddlers, both in London and in the countryside. And they attract attention from the public at large, uh, not the kind of attraction that one wants to, um, you know, and that kind of attention that one really wants to attract. A few of them, and only a tiny number of them, do come from uh, prosperous families in Holland and in the German states. And they're usually younger sons or relatives who are sent to do business in Britain because Britain is becoming very quickly the leading economic power in the world. And the, again, the best known example is Nathan Rothschild, who comes to England not as a banker. He's sent by his father from Frankfurt to go to settle in Manchester, where he buys cotton, wholesale, cotton goods wholesale, and then ships them back to Germany for sale and distribution there by the Rothschild family. Another thing that sets off this uh, wave of migration is that these Jews um, tend to be, their Judaism tends to be more consistent because they don't come from a converso background. Uh, their Judaism tends to be more robust and more closely observed. Um, and so they tend to create uh, charities, schools, they import rabbis, mainly from the continent, and they blend into English society much more slowly. Uh, they settle primarily in London, almost two thirds of them. In fact, throughout most of its history, two thirds of Jews in Britain have lived in London. But they also begin to commit uh, to create communities in the provinces, particularly in towns which are naval ports, um, and then in some country trading towns. Uh, but they're so dispersed, and they're in such visual occupations that Jewish peddlers and Jewish street dealers are common figures in the lithographs of the 18th and early 19th century. The fourth wave, which we could just arbitrarily say begins about 1815 and goes up to about 1870, is really a continuation of the previous wave. But it's now from a broader area of Central Europe, not just the German states, but it also includes Posen, which had become part of, was slowly, was, had become part of Germany, but was really Polish in character. And it also includes Habsburg territories. And again, it's partly because whereas Jews in Britain were quite free, really by the 18th century, that wasn't true um, on the continent. And so there's a pushing Jews out who are interested in li living in much freer conditions and having more opportunities. The other thing to keep in mind is that England enjoys uh, a stronger and stronger position in the uh, economic world. And particularly it's marked by it's phenomenal demographic growth. By 1800, about a million people lived in London. And that number continues to uh, increase extraordinarily over the course of the 19th century. Then that was another way of looking at it is that there's, there's, there's rising, uh, increasing consumer demand. And much of the, this uh, fourth wave of immigration is a migration not of poor unskilled peddlers, uh, but in fact of merchants and dealers in, that are, uh, in goods that are required by the uh, increasingly prosperous British middle class. So you find dealers in pottery, china, leather goods, jewelry, 
optical goods, cigars, other forms of tobacco, antique furniture, furnishings, picture frames, etc., toys. All of these things are characteristic of Jews who arrive from Germany in the middle of the 19th century. Their process of acculturation, again, goes somewhat slower, but very slowly, they also make their way up the economic ladder. Um, so by the end of the 19th century, the majority of Jews who had arrived from Germany in the course of the early parts and the middle parts of the century uh, had moved into comfortable commercial positions. Um, they were wholesalers, they were, uh, had uh, substantial shops, uh, they were dealers in all kinds of luxury goods, <clears throat> but its commerce was the basis of their support. Small number of them began to become professionals, uh, doctors and lawyers, but this was very, very slow. Um, and it doesn't occur right away at all. Um, so really commerce is the, the backbone uh, or the source of Anglo-Jewish or bourgeoisement in the 19th century. The second half of the 19th century is also important because this is the period in which British Jews develop and create and expand the institutions that have defined British Jewry up until the present day. That is the origins of the chief rabbinate, the board of deputies, the United Synagogue, and a whole variety of communal wide charities can be dated back to the mid 19th century. Some of these organizations claim they have predecessors beginning in the 18th century, but they really um, assume in their occupation or their organizational uh, profile that, that we know them by only in the second half of the 19th century. One thing I should also point out about uh, <clears throat> these Jews uh, and the institutions they create is they create a highly centralized order. That is, the chief rabbi enjoys powers uh, in Britain that no chief rabbi anywhere in the world uh, occupied at that time. Similarly, the Board of Deputies and the United Synagogue assume an importance to London-based that most communal organizations, other European countries didn't enjoy. Some people see this as a good thing. Some people see it as a bad thing, depending on one's perspective. Um, let me pass on now to the fifth wave. This is the wave of immigration that most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, and that's the migration from Eastern Europe. Between 1870 and the beginning of World War I in 1914, somewhere between 120 and 150,000 uh, Jews from Eastern Europe settled in Britain. Actually more passed through, but those passing through were usually on their way to the United States. Uh, and some only stayed a matter of uh, months, sometimes only a matter of weeks. But certainly more arrived than 120,000 or 150,000. But that's the number who we estimate settled there, uh, basically. These are Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazim from the Russian Empire and some parts of the Habsburg Empire, mainly Galicia and Hungary. And again, to see it in context, uh, it's not Britain alone that's receiving this mass migration from Eastern Europe at the time. It's part of a much larger westward migration, the great bulk of which went to the United States. But France, Germany, uh, Latin America, Canada also received Jews uh, coming from Eastern Europe at the time. This is the single largest migration of Jews from anywhere into Britain. And partly because of its size, and partly because it, we, they were occupationally concentrated in the garment trade, in furniture manufacturing, and shoe manufacturing, as, mainly as workers, uh, it tended to attract a lot of attention. Um, most Jews in Britain today are descendants of these Jews. Um, and the influence of this uh, migration is very, very strong, but it doesn't mean that it defines all Jews. There are still Jews who can trace their origins back to the German migration 
of the 19th century and a tiny handful of families that can trace their origins back to the 18th and even in some cases even the 17th century. There is a sixth wave of migration um, and that is the migration that's associated with the refuge, flee, flight of refugees from German occupied Europe. Between 1933 and 19, September 1939, when the war began on the continent, about, again, that's an estimate, about 80,000 Jews um, ended up settling in Britain. Uh, the number would have been much larger uh, had the British government uh, been more welcoming. In the whole, it wasn't welcoming, uh, but certainly it would have been over 100,000 more because Jews were desperate to get out of Germany and then after March 38 out of Austria and then later out of Prague. Uh, these were German speaking Jews. They had a tremendous influence uh, upon British culture, uh, science and the academy, uh, but their influence was less as Jews and more as intellectuals and cultural figures. Uh, after World War II, there isn't much migration into Britain. Small numbers come from Egypt, Iran, and Aden uh, as a result of pressures exerted by uh, the withdrawal of the European powers and then the creation of Zionism in the State of Israel. And small numbers arrive from Hungary after 1956 and the failed revolution there. Now, much of the history of British Jewry, uh, certainly in the first half of the 20th century, and really maybe going up to, oh, yeah. uh, maybe going up through the um, middle of the 20th century, um, is the history of the newcomers from the East European migration challenging those who had come in the 19th and 18th centuries. So you have a ongoing battles over control of the board of deputies, over who is going to be chief rabbi, uh, over the Jew control of the Jewish chronicle, etc. The Jewish population in Britain hits its zenith uh, just after World War II, when it was about four hundred thousand people. Um, these again are guesstimates. Okay, we don't have any figures since there are no. Jews have never been counted uh, involuntarily uh, as Jews uh, on the census. Um, today, the Jewish population is much less. It's probably 290,000. You can see there's a big difference between 400,000 and 290,000. Uh, the broader Jewish population is about 320,000. Now, why do we have these two figures, a core Jewish population and a broader Jewish population? Demographers and sociologists have a hard time today determining who is Jewish. They <clears throat> tend not to use uh, the halachic definition of who is Jewish, but tend to use a different kind of definition, uh, which is more expansive. So that's why you get two numbers. So we could say at least 290,000 are obviously Jewish, maybe 320,000 are. Now, the fall in the number of Jews is due to two major things. One is a declining birth rate, where Jews used to have very large families, particularly in the Victorian period. I just finished writing a biography of someone who was one of 15 siblings. He was born in 1876. Uh, but those kind of size families, um, the only people that come close to them now are the Haredim, but the British Jewish population as a whole, uh, as it became more and more middle class, it is restricted to the size of its families. And that's common of, of newly, uh, of groups that come join the bourgeoisie anywhere in the world. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that, and this is, uh, may sound odd, Britain has been very welcoming in the sense that it has been willing to allow and to entertain the idea of intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews. So it's the high rate of intermarriage and extensive drift and defection, uh, not so much conversion to Christianity, but intermarriage and then an embrace of what we might call religious nothingness. 
So that has reduced the size of the Jewish population. Now, let me say something just very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time left, um, about some of the defining trends in the 19th and 20th century. First of all, let me say something about the political situation. On the whole, Jewish political status has never been a major or persistent political issue. Uh, historians sometimes refer to this uh, phenomena of questions of Jewish integration and acculturation and, and uh, legal status as the Jewish question. Um, there has never been a Jewish question in Britain in the way there was in Germany or Austria or France. Um, at the same time, because the major obstacle, the, the major obstacle to Jewish integration into all kinds of occupation, and particularly into positions of authority and prestige, has not been laws against Jews, but what are known as Christological oaths. These were oaths that people had to take when they entered a certain profession or entered the universities or whatever, uh, that were designed initially to keep out dissenters and Roman Catholics, people who were not members of the Church of England, by making them swear their loyalty to the church, uh, et cetera. Um, and as they drop, and they do drop, uh, most of them were moved and removed in the course of the 19th century without a great deal of fuss, again, relative to, to what was happening in Europe. I guess you could say the flip side of this is that anti-Semitism was really never central, I want to emphasize central, to mainstream politics or political discourse in the United Kingdom in the way it was in Germany, Austria, Hungary, political Russia. We might argue about how central it has become to the radical part of the Labour Party. But that's, it's, I would argue that's a different kind of issue. And, in, and the Jewish question, the way that it flourished in Europe on the continent, never really first and no party really ever took it up with much enthusiasm. Although in cultural and social life, it's always been quite present. And as we know in the current contem contemporary situations, there's a whole kind of cesspool of anti-Jewish tropes that various groups can draw on at times and do use. And in certain kinds of circumstances, like recent controversies about Israel, these will be easily tapped. Now, let me say something also about the religious trends. Now, again, I'm speaking very briefly and very generally because uh, <clears throat> this is an enormous topic. For most of the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, Orthodox Judaism was the dominant variety of Judaism in Britain. Um, three reform congregations were formed in the 19th century, one in London, one in Manchester, and one in Bradford. And none of them were what could be described as radical reform congregations. Reform Judaism historically had very, as certainly before World War II or before the 1930s, had little appeal to British Jews for a variety of reasons. One being that they tended to value tra tradition qua tradition, and also uh, because they didn't have to prove uh, their loyalty by uh, embracing a denationalized reform Judaism. And there was this great respect for traditional forms. And that doesn't mean they were pious Jews. Uh, there's no indication that British, well, probably not, most British Jews probably no more uh, traditional in terms of observance in the 19th century or the early 20th century than their counterparts on the, uh, in elsewhere in Western and Central Europe. But they were, so to speak, members of traditional congregations. Uh, liberal or reform forms of Judaism only begin to make penetration into Britain in the, the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and again, what's also typical of the second half of the 20th century has been the flourishing, the blossoming of what we might call non-centrist orthodoxy, 
strict orthodoxy, ultra orthodoxy, the Haredim, the different terms are used. Uh, this form of Judaism has uh, uh, sunk very deep roots, <clears throat> and because they they tend to uh, emphasize adherence to the mitzvot and their interpretation of the mitzvot over their pursuit of uh, economic mobility, uh, their communities are, have very large families, um, and they tend to play a greater and greater role, they, or rather they become a greater and greater part of the demographic mix of British Jewry as a whole. <clears throat> and one last thing I will say about on the social scene, to say something about the social uh, patterns, um, the most dominant trend in British Jewish history as what I would call a gradual embourgeoisement, a gradual movement into the middle and upper middle class. Um, this has occurred repeatedly with each immigrant wave after it had been established for a generation or two. The basis of this was not education. Education played, rel not university education at least, uh, university education played very little role in social mobility and economic mobility in Britain until the post-World War II period. Uh, but rather, it was the fact that the, the, the Jews were concentrated in commerce when they arrived in Britain, and the explosive consumer demand up this continued up and through at least the middle of the 20th century, and this enabled them. So that was one defining characteristic. Another defining characteristic has been what I would call drift and defection. Uh, the secularization of the Jewish community in Britain, uh, despite the still uh, organization, orthodox organizational framework of much of the community, uh, the widespread social integration, the way in which Jews have been willingly accepted into all kinds of social networks, clubs, universities, whatever, the high rate of intermarriage and the low birth rate. Uh, the real question, of course, is I'm, I'm not a uh, futurologist, but I'm always asked this question, and, uh, I'm, and that is, what does the future hold? Um, and one could say only that if the current rates of Secularization, secularization, and social integration, and intermarriage, and low birth rate among the majority of British Jews continue, and if the strictly Orthodox continue to maintain a high birth rate, then it seems that they will play a larger and larger role in determining both the character of British Jewry um, and uh, its ten its tenor, its, its institutional thing as the centrist institutions become increase, increasingly pushed to the sides by the growing numbers of those. Now that's not a prediction uh, for next year or even necessarily next decade. Uh, I'm a historian, uh, I'm not a prophet, uh, so uh, I don't deal in prophecy, but let me do suggest that these things are bound to develop in certain ways um, that may mean that things will not be as they've been in the past, but then change is inherently part of the historical process. I think we have some time for questions now. And um, if you've sent things into the chat, uh, Karen's going to. Yes, we do. Uh, thank you so much. This has been a very rich sweep through such a huge a uh, swathe of history. So thank you so much. You've really set the scene for this series. I'm going to, we've had various comments and we've had some specific questions and please everybody uh, do write your questions and I'll do my best to address them. Going right back, um, there's some, uh, Eve, Eva Arnett has been talking about Henry Tudor and the Battle of Bosworth, um, after which there were various attempts to restore the Plantagenets one was in the name of, of supposed son of Edward IV, Perkin Warbeck, whose guardian was apparently a Portuguese Jewish spice merchant, Sir Edward Brampton. Do you have any um, sort of background on this? Was this, uh, um, this Portuguese Jewish spice merchant part of a wider group 
or is this just a coincidence? I don't know if this is a something you're familiar with, Todd. Um, I, I don't have the specifics on that, but as I said before, uh, before the return of the conversos in the 17th century, that's during the Tudor period, there were individual Jews, or per, let me better, rather than say Jews, let me say persons, Spanish and Portuguese merchants and traders of Jewish origin. They may have been sincere Catholics, and, and, uh, but nonetheless, they were of Jewish origin. And this is probably as far as it went. We, we know very little about the inner life of these people. Um, that's the problem. We, right. we, they were of Jewish origin and they probably knew that, but that's all we can say. Right, we can only speculate. I mean, connected with that, we've had a comment about um, Oliver Cromwell being opposed to the Inquisition. Kevin Martin has added quite a lot of different comments throughout your talk. Um, do you have any, do you know if, if that's based on any specific evidence? Well, the Inquisition was a Catholic institution. And so it would be obvious that he would be opposed to it. Okay, fair enough. And, and I, I should also say, um, Protestant polemicists, in which I'll include Cromwell, um, always singled out the Inquisition as a sign of Catholic bigotry, um, untoleration, and ignorance in contrasting the enlightened Christianity of Englishmen. Mm. Right. Thank you. Well, I'm just got Tadeusz has just sent me a message that somebody has asked about the impact um, on settling from Parliament's Plantation Act in 1740, inviting Jews to settle in the colonies. So those are Jews leaving um, Britain for the colonies uh, under the empire. Um, would you would you like to comment on on that impact? Yeah. Well. Um... There were Jews, there were Jewish traders, both Ashkenazim and Sfardim, but it was mainly Sfardim, who settled in the Caribbean. And the act of 1740 was intended to make them easy, ease their position, their legal position there. But it didn't have any impact on Jews in Britain itself. Um, so when the Jew Bill of 1753 comes up, it is meant to, in, uh, to address the problems of mainly of well-to-do Jews who could not seek naturalization be, because there was a, I say well-to-do Jews who were born abroad who could not seek naturalization because they had to take a Christological oath. The, the, the Jew Bill of 1753 is much understood. It was not Jewish emancipation. It wasn't right. an invitation to invite Jews back to Britain. And the 1740 Act, which was intended for the colonies, had nothing to do with it. And the okay. Jews, and the Jews who, many of the Jews, many of the Jews who made their fortunes in the colonies as traders, then returned to Britain and set up as country gentlemen. Thank you. I, we've got one question which goes right back to the beginning of your talk, and then one which is much more um, related to modern times. So, um, I, again, you're talking about the speculation, what we do and don't know. Um, Marion is asking, is anything known about whether William the Conqueror had some Jewish ancestry through maybe a grandparent? <laughs> I've never heard that before. Okay. <laughs> I have to say um, that's a new one. <laughs> right. Well, um, and then we've had another um, question right up to the 20th century, uh, Mr. Zell asking, can you elaborate on how the Jewish community dealt with the government during the Lehi Ilgun Hagana fight against the British, and obviously during the mandate and the years leading up to the establishment of the State of Israel? Um, they tried to disassociate themselves. They, they preferred it all to go away. They were in a very difficult position, very difficult position, <clears throat> because one of the tactics of the Stern Gang and of Lehi uh, were to uh, murder British soldiers and civilian officials in mandatory Palestine as a way to drive out the British. 
Uh, and as David Cesarani has written about, the, the, the efforts extended also to sending letter bombs um, in, uh, to government officials and others in Britain, most of which didn't go off. One went off with some, in some minor uh, club for Commonwealth students. Uh, but they were very upset about that and tended to denounce. Now, not all British Jews did. Uh, it so happens this, the fellow who I was, Salomon, who I've written this biography of, uh, he couldn't bring himself to uh, publicly denounce the terrorism because he understood what was motivating them. He thought that the British treatment of uh, Zionist aspirations had been shoddy. Now, he had served in Palestine <clears throat> in World War II, in World War I, and he had seen how Britain had reneged on the Balfour Declaration. So while he didn't approve, he wasn't going to go publicly and, and denounce them and refuse to. Thank you. Um, we've had some really interesting comments, and I just want to say that even the second time round, it's been fascinating listening listening to um, you speak, Todd. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for, your, for attending and for your comments. So we're now getting some lovely comments thanking, um, uh, thanking you, Todd. From, from our audience here. And I add the thanks of us at the National Library of Israel. Um, we hope we'll be able to invite you on another occasion, but wishing you all um, a very good night from Jerusalem. And please join us as the link has been put onto the chat and um, register to get updates on our forthcoming events. All the best.